Is your coffee sun grown or shade grown? Do you know the answer to this? Would you be able to answer this? What does it mean and why does it matter? Well, today's episode is about this question. It's about this topic. And it's inspired by a conversation I was lucky enough to have with Professor Amanda Cordill from Columbia University in New York. Now, Mandy reached out to me following my episode on what you can claim about supply chains in coffee. Now, I'm really glad that Mandy reached out to me. It's so interesting that when we talk about sustainability in coffee, nearly all the time, we just mean money. We mean, did we pay enough? Now, I understand where this comes from. It comes from the colonial slave-based history of coffee, which means we're right to be concerned about how the coffee makes its way through the supply chain. But it's also kind of ridiculous, right? If I said to you about any other product that I bought, whether it was a Harry OV60 or, well, anything, a glass, uh, and I said to you, well, this is sustainable because I paid a good price for it, you'd laugh at me and you'd say, well, you know, what's it made of? What's the carbon footprint? You know, just using the word sustainability doesn't and cannot just mean you paid a decent price. Now, every year, students that Mandy teaches uh, get to do uh, an exercise. They get to go around Manhattan Island in New York and pop into specialty coffee shops and ask the barista or the server three very simple questions. They get to ask them where their coffee's from, whether their coffee's certified, and lastly, whether the coffee is sun or shade grown. Now let's talk to Mandy and see what answers she gets every year and dig deeper into this concept of shade grown. What does it mean? Why is it good? And how can we perhaps consider it more alongside other aspects of sustainability in coffee? I did my PhD mainly looking at wildlife habitat and coffee farms. So working in India, and then when I was in Costa Rica, I was writing for the New York Times. They used to have the scientist at work blog. And through that, the director of the Smithsonian Bird Friendly Coffee Program um, reached out to me because he had seen those articles and said, you know, we do all this research on birds. We have hardly anything on mammals. Would you consider doing a postdoc with us? So I went to the Smithsonian for my postdoc, and that's where I got a little bit more involved with the industry side of coffee. So we worked with roasters and, you know, started going to the SEA expos. And um, yeah, so that's that's where my, my coffee knowledge kind of started going from the, the origin side, looking at, at wildlife and sustainability within the farms, and then has branched out from there. Yeah, I mean, you've got to understand the whole chain, right? Mm -hmm. It's all super okay. linked. So the predominance of your work, uh, sorry, just clarify, has been in India, Costa Rica. Is there a third one I'm missing? Mexico. Mexico. Uh, and so they're three distinctly different coffee producing origins. They are. Costa Rica and Mexico are, are somewhat similar, but India for sure is very different. Yeah, and uh, I don't think we'll get onto it in a bit, but it's um, quite a lot of the coffee grown in India is shade grown. It is. Yeah, that's super yeah. interesting. Um, yeah, it's, most of it's Robusta. Yeah, exactly. An argument for Robusta. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, cool. So the, for me, it's interesting because um, I think, yeah, we have to also almost challenge the practices of farming coffee as well as figure out how to make it sustainable economically. This term shade grown, I mean, I think a lot of people watching may have heard it somehow, but not know what it means. And I, I remember when we first caught up, you outlined um, uh, a project that you give students uh, of going around specialty coffee shops and asking three questions. And I thought it was a, it'd be really good to start there to show sort of one of the challenges here about knowledge and visibility around this topic. Yeah, for sure. So um, I teach a couple of, of classes here in New York City. I'm an adjunct professor at Columbia University. Um, this class or the, the project that I shared with you is from the new school. So I had an undergraduate class of about 23 students, I think, and I ask each of them for a class project to go to 10 different coffee shops and just ask three questions to the person serving you the coffee. So that's either the cashier or the barista. Um, and so the first one was, do you know the origin of the coffee? Most of them did. So that number is like 93%. Um, yeah, so that was good. And then the second one was, is the coffee certified? And most knew that as well. So 
50% of the copy was certified, 31% was not, and then 19% didn't know one way or the other. And, and these certifications were uh, the typical ones we'd know, like fair trade, organic? Yeah, so most of them were organic. I think it was like 50% were organic. Um, I think about 30% were fair trade. There was one bird friendly in there. Um, that wow. was it. <laughs> I know. Um, the last, the last question is the one that, that I've been most interested in is, do you know if the copy is shade grown or sun grown? And um, we had 18% said it was shade, 5% said it was sun, 10% said they sold both, and then 67% had no idea. Um, and most of them didn't, didn't know what the definition of that was either. And this isn't, it's not something that's uncommon, but if the person serving you your coffee doesn't know the definition or, or know about origins, then how are we supposed to raise awareness and educate consumers about coffee? Yeah, and to, to, to sort of, um, you know, dig a little deeper, um, <laughs> uh, the, do, you, do you think all the people who said it's shade grown would be able to back up <laughs> with a certification or, 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 or they're just thinking out of the two, they're siding with that one? Because it, it makes me sort of suspicious that the sun grown was lower than the shade grown, which yeah. suggests that if you said to someone, oh, is it sun or shade? there might be an on the spot, oh, I think shade sounds better. I think it's shade grown. Yeah, agreed. I, I, don't, I don't know. So the only, there's only one certification that requires shade, the Smithsonian bird friendly one. Um, there's Rainforest Alliance that has a shade criteria, part of their standards, but it's not a requirement. It's an optional um, standard. So yeah, there are a lot of bags you'll see out there that have shade grown on it or have that that language, but they're not third party verified. Yes, yeah, so so. as well as the, um, the 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 terms such as trace, traceable, transparent, ethical, shade mm -hmm. grown essentially uh, could end up in that same bucket of a, a term that's used with, you know, with no verification or no real meaning. Yeah, yeah for sure. So how would how would you define shade grown? So shade grown is coffee that's grown under a diverse canopy of shade trees. Um, it's also called coffee agroforestry if you're looking at like ecological literature um, or just shade coffee for short. Okay, and is there, you know, I, I've seen, um, I, was, I was doing a little bit of research. Uh, it's, it's all very fascinating. Uh, some of the papers that you've uh, authored, but also some other articles and there's sort of a range of shade, right? There's full sun, mm -hmm. uh, and then there's like a little bit of shade, uh, and then there's like full uh, sort of deep canopy forest. And obviously the, 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 the diversity and variety of, of canopy coverage, I guess, is directly correlated to uh, the diversity of species, both potentially bird and mammal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So there's the top, tier of shade grown coffee is called rustic coffee and that's basically a forest with coffee plants in the understory and that's how coffee is naturally grown so it's a, a very shade tolerant crop um, and for animals and for habitat most animals don't eat coffee so there's the civet cat that we know eats the coffee fruit elephants we'll get to eat it, yeah. <laughs> right well now yeah they started being caged and forced to eat it um, Cows, I hear, eat anything, so they'll eat the fruit. But what you're looking for in terms of habitat and shade coffee is something that mimics a, a natural forest is best because you have those different resources for habitat and for food resources for all the different wildlife that are there. Totally. And, and I guess that's sort of the ultimate, right? Sort of a, a natural environment. But is that realistically commercial based on what we charge for coffee? And I guess if it comes back to cost you know if you take something like a gesher which uh you know can't be planted as close to each other produces less cherry that pushes the price up mm -hmm. you know could you say okay well we could actually create the ideal environment for growing coffee under shade but yes it would have to cost more because we'd have to farm the land less yes for sure um there's there's a balance somewhere in there and i don't think we know the exact percent but of yield of coffee farms and the amount of shade cover so coffee does require to, to have some sunlight. 
um, and also having a lot of different different plants within the coffee farms, like the plants are competing for resources. So there's a balance that's in there, especially for, you know, it's a commercial crop, as you said. Yeah, it's interesting, I guess, right? I think with a, a few of these things, whether it's recycling or, or, or going what we're here today, that's what perfect looks like. And there's a whole range in the middle. Mm. And it's sort of how can you encourage, you know, everybody to improve. So, but, you know, there is perfect, but then, any improvement, almost like a staged improvement to go, and this is how you would improve the ecology and the sustainability on the farm. Mm -hmm. It feels like it would have to be stepped and a bit contextual. Definitely. And having a market for a shade coffee, like right now, people don't know about it. So there's not a market, there's not really a demand for it. So the farmers that are growing shade coffee aren't getting financially rewarded for it. So there's not a lot of incentive so it's just that effectively if it costs the same that you're getting penalized really <laughs> yeah exactly i mean there's other there's other things that that um factor into it like the ecosystem services and shade coffee so if you have diverse shade and it's good habitat for birds for example they will eat the coffee berry borer so you're reducing the, the disease and the yeah how, and that's um uh, does, does that also tie across to reduced use of pesticides and chemicals? Mm -hmm, exactly. Right, which is a less cost because you're not you're not paying for you're that. not paying for them. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Now I feel like I need to know how much they cost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of times things like that aren't factored into the the financial assessments. There's also studies about pollinators. So if you have diverse pollinators. Um, yeah. You can increase your yield within the coffee. So coffee is self-pollinating. It doesn't, it doesn't need pollinators, but if you have diverse pollinators, then studies have shown anywhere from 10 to 50% increase in yield. So oh, wow. that's a benefit. Yeah, so there are benefits, but I guess there's a bit of a long-term approach to this, right? To, yeah. uh, to say, okay, well, this is where we are today. And some of these things, you know, you, you invest now for the future, taking a holistic approach really of, the farm but coffee is a commercial crop and it, it isn't simply giving things up i think we're seeing that more and more with lots of sustainable practices there is a way to approach it which it you know is good business mm -hmm. interesting um the bird can i can i touch on the smithsonian certification then uh, do, do you know how prevalent you said in your study there was one out of how many coffee shops did <laughs> there was like 193 i think shops um you don't see that's it. A, that's a lot of shops, by the way. So the <laughs> students went to all of those shops. That's what they said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean, you don't see it a lot. And I, I look out for it, obviously, and I rarely see it. Um, in terms of the number of farms that are certified bird friendly, that's quite small as well. It's I think it's around 50 or so now. And the certification has been around for... I don't know, maybe like 20 years, something like that. Um, the strength, the standards are really stringent. So the amount of shade and the different types of shade trees that have to be in the farms is quite high. Um, but I don't think that that's the barrier. I, I think it's just people don't know about shade grown coffee and um, they're not looking out for it. So there's not the demand for, for the bird friendly certification. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, if, if I know uh, it's obviously Robusta, which in, in particular, the narrative is less important for uh, compared to Arabica. Mm. But if you took someone, yeah, like a, a lot of that Indian coffee, which is, would it, it would effectively be able to pass the Smithsonian um, certification more easily. For the shade part of it. So the other part of the Smithsonian certification is that it first has to be certified organic. Right. And that's one that I've heard is a, a barrier to entry for a lot of coffee farmers. Um, the places where I studied in India, there was a, a decent amount of chemical use um, and only one farm out of, I studied 20 farms in that region, only one was certified organic. So in terms of the shade and the diverse canopy, for sure. And so, so as well as the, uh, the conversation about existing certifications, um, you start a project of your own called Copy Vignette Storytelling, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which was, you know, a, a less 
certified way. So that rather than going down that route of these uh, official orders and certifications, uh, it was about engaging in storytelling and awareness. Right. Right. So, that? yeah. So that it it started from from being at Origin and then learning more about the industry and then teaching classes and giving talks all over the world about shade coffee and realizing there's just this huge disconnect between consumers and and people in the import countries and what goes on at Origin and we're missing that that storyline. Um, so I, um, I've been talking to a whole bunch of people throughout the industry just to kind of try to understand where this disconnect is happening and why, um, and who's responsible for educating consumers and for telling this coffee story. And it's, it's been a really interesting experience, but it seems that at every step along the way, we're pointing fingers at the other person. So like the roaster retailers are saying, no, this needs to come from the importers. And the importers saying, no, the story is getting disconnected from the exporters. Um, and so that's when I saw your talk about transparency and accountability. I was like, yes, it's exactly what's happening. Like we're not, somehow this is all getting lost and none of us are, are being accountable or um, wanting to really have this traceability in place. Yeah, it um, feels like... Um that there's a lack of a sort of interest or willing to sort of explore the hard questions and really dig in. Uh, and it, it's all a little bit of um, sort of cosmetic face value uh, claims really. Right. Yeah, actually I went to um, the RICO virtual conference, the SEA conference uh, is last week, gave a talk on shade copy of course. Um, but there was this great quote that came out of one of the talks, this man, uh, Louis Samper, from Colombia said, in terms of like trying to figure out how to have a more equitable value chain and telling these, these coffee stories, he said, we should stop playing the Indiana Jones type of marketing effort where these buyers go into these exotic places and they discover these jewels of coffee that are so unique. Um, and then they're the hero of the story and the coffee community and the producers are just completely left out. And I. I think that was something that resonated with with a lot of people because it's something that we are seeing a lot in the industry. Yeah, I mean, if you, I, I, I firmly believe that in anything complex, and every, every time you see a talk on coffee or some research, everyone uses the word complex, which is absolutely applicable and fair. It is a complex uh, product supply chain, uh, you know, lots going on. But it also means that I think you can focus customers and people on sort of one narrative. So if you decide that narrative is that uh, Indiana Jones or that coffee hunter, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's what people are taking, right? And I also think it plays down. It's this idea that the producer wasn't in power of creating that coffee. It had to be found. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, I feel for me on the whole sustainability story, uh, there's a little bit of that sort of, uh, that sort of white savior mentality thing where it's like, Go, you know, that's the narrative you hear all the time. Mm -hmm. And actually that stops two things, which is not only is it sort of disrespectful to a, you know, a very professional farm that knows exactly what it's doing. Uh, it also stops the rest of the chain challenging the farm because it should go both ways. You know, mm -hmm. you know if, if, you, if you have got an established farm, with great coffees and, and it's commercially viable, then the next question is, okay, well, what does the biodiversity or the ecology on that farm look like? And what is the best farming practice? So I think actually, yeah, the quicker we skip everyone in the middle and just tell the story of the farms, <laughs> it sort of benefits everyone really. Right. Yeah, I mean, we, um, we've, uh, we do this project in Mozambique and it's a, a national park in Northern Mozambique and they didn't grow coffee there at all. Uh, it's lots of philanthropic money from an American tech billionaire. The Norwegian government and National Geographic and they um, lots of people have supported the project and they've gone look we can grow coffee here really well and we can grow cashews as the two uh, crops and there's lots of other but it's but it's the coffee is part of that whole mountain so there's you know they need to increase uh, and regenerate the rainforest and the wildlife at the same time and they need to improve you know the lives of the people living on the mountains so the human impact and so they decided that coffee was going, they needed it to be good to get enough money for it. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I was talking to a Brazilian plant that said the same thing. Like they're focusing on specialty because it's more sustainable because they can ask for more money, right? Uh, but then they also said, we're only ever going to grow so much coffee on this national park because we, we know the limit. We know, going back to the shade growing, we know if we go past that, we're not improving the ecology of, or the environment on the mountain. And so they realized, okay, if we can only grow so much coffee, then selling it to an exporter, to an importer, to a roaster, to a shop, to a customer, with a small amount of coffee, well, it's just not worth it. And so they're trying to figure out how they can get the brand of the mountain straight to the customer. And I remember, so you've got that project in Mozambique and um, a very different project, you know, actually quite a wealthy project in Panama. You get quite a lot of expats. Um, going and setting up coffee farms a bit like vineyards. So it's like the complete opposite end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Also trying to do that and say, well, actually coffee capsules are interesting because you know, you, this was a, uh, a producer called Jameson who uh, owns Finca Deborah in Panama, who was really interested in capsule coffee because he could do everything a bit like a wine producer and say, okay, well, I can grow the coffee, process the coffee, roast the coffee here, package it here, and then people around the world can buy from my farm and not have to go through everyone else. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think, um, I mean, obviously the wine analogy is sort of probably overused, but it is interesting. I think that's where we need to go because otherwise the conversation is always going to be too complicated. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it's um, the whole value chain is, is complicated in coffee. And I think the, the global aspect of it is, is one thing that, that you know makes the nuances even that more apparent. But the interesting thing is that it's it's also not all that complicated. It's just one thing. Like there's not all these additives, you know, we're not talking about all these different sources when we're trying to talk about, you know, what we want to tell the consumer. It's it's just one product. Like it's yeah. something that, that we can we can do it somehow. We just haven't figured out a, a good way, I think, at this point. Yeah, I mean, the menu ones, I mean, I hate coffee menus because all those drinks, I mean, when, I, when we opened our first cafe, all those drinks, I mean, I mean, that menu's a joke, right? Piccolo, <laughs> espresso, ristretto, I mean, come on, it's some water and coffee through an espresso machine, <laughs> it's, it's been milk, and then you just change the ratios. Right. You have, like this menu with 20 things on it. So I think what happened potentially is when consumers didn't resonate as well with the story of coffee as a as a farm product, mm. your marketing focuses elsewhere. Because well, what can we get them interested in? And then you end up with the legacy of whatever did work, uh, and you have to sort of keep on doing that and keep on doing that and keep on doing that. Um, but I think, you know, it, do you see where do you see more interest in? Obviously, you said you've been to your students and yourself. Lots of people don't know what shade grown means from a uh, con consumer or barista or point of view when you talk to producers and farmers do, do they are all super aware of what good would look like or uh, and w would want to do more but don't see the benefit in doing it or well, what's the awareness like on shade grown as a value proposition at a farm level yeah it, de it depends um so in terms of getting if they were to go the shade grown route of getting the bird friendly certification the what I hear is the organic part is not something that they find feasible. A lot of places will say, you know, we're too small and organic. You know, it's a, a there's a lot, it's a big ask to go organic. You have to be organic for three years um, before you can even start getting premiums um, and get the organic certification. So a lot of farmers will say, if we had a, a really big piece of property, then we could maybe do it in stages. Um, and get that organic piece and then uh, get certified bird friendly. Um, in Costa Rica, a lot of the farmers um, don't have a lot of different types of shade trees. So it's you know one or two different types of shade trees. And for the bird friendly, it has to be 11 native shade tree species. So they're not interested in, in doing that. Um, sometimes you know, the farmers will say, this is where, this is where we plant our coffee. This is our crop of coffee. And, you know, we, we have a conservation easement in the forest over here. Like, isn't, aren't we doing enough? Like, why do we have to have them intermixed within, within the coffee farm, which gets into yeah, this whole so other, 
Yeah. That's the sort of Brazilian model, isn't it? Where 20%, you know, the part, the land that is owned by the producer, I think there's the goal there is 20% is forest effectively. But then okay. you're sort of separating the two, right? And then you've got just big 80% sun grown and 20% forest rather than trying to integrate the two. Right. Right. And that's, I mean, I, I, I can understand that point, um, but in terms of, of the value of the, the shade grown coffee, it has to be intermixed. So um, that reduces the amount of chemicals that you have to put on the farm because the shade trees provide nutrients into the soil. The shade trees have deep roots, so they hold the soil in place. Um, so you don't have soil erosion, which is good, especially if you have chemicals that you're using, because a lot of times the soil, uh, the chemicals go down with the soil into the water systems. Um, and then for birds and other um, flying animals, they're able to jump from place to place. But for some of the things that I've studied that are small and terrestrial, their habitat is really small. Their range is very small. So whatever you're doing on the, on the farm impacts them. Um, and then another thing that we see if you have sun coffee and then forest and you're using a lot of chemicals is there's like a leaching that goes into the forest as well in terms of the chemical oh, wow. to degrade that line of the forest. So there's, there's good arguments for having the shade within the farm, um, the shade trees within the farm, but that's, I, I understand the, the farmer's position, you know, saying this is, this is our coffee and this is our, our forest. I think it's, it's a difficult, you know, when you're talking about, I mean, I would put everything in a wildlife conservation easement, but that's not a, a, a type of agriculture that's viable. You know, this is, this is somebody's livelihood. This is an income generator. Um, but the really cool thing with coffee is that where it's grown, it's grown in areas of really high biodiversity in the tropics, and it can be grown under the shade. So yeah, I think that's the interesting story here, right? It's, yeah, you're not saying to people, stop growing coffee. You're saying, actually, this is kind of an interesting crop in that there is scenarios here that work. Mm -hmm. I was just and had a question. Since the beginning, you know, since it started being yeah. cultivated. I had uh, questions on, um, I think I was reading that sometimes people claim shade grown, but, you know, uh, other crops, effectively, other commercial crops, you know, providing some shade isn't necessarily as ideal, or is there a world where you can, you know, have, okay, we've got the, the coffee, that's our primary crop, um, diverse uh, shade uh, and, and forestry, but we also have some other uh, crops within that. Is there, a, is there somewhere where you could, you know, make some money from other uh, crops that could also provide shade? Yeah, and they do. There's, there's a lot of different fruit trees that you can plant within and shade. Um, there's also uh, different types of trees that provide wood that you can intersperse within the coffee. Um, I've heard of those. There's also, uh, there's more things going on with, with bees and starting to produce honey and coffee. So you'll wow. see honey that's made of the, the coffee flowers, which is cool. I bet that tastes nice. Yeah, I haven't had it, I don't think, but yeah. Yeah, I bet that tastes really nice. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Um, and and so, you you uh, in terms of awareness, you, you you know you're clearly very passionate about the topic and take part in you know give talks and agree to to come on here. Um, do do you think do you think it's all tied in? To, where where do where do you think potentially? And I know that when we first spoke, you asked me this question. <laughs> you said, "How are we going to fix it?" Um, <laughs> Uh, I guess we could both discuss it, but, you know, is the most powerful, is it, you know, using, because that's the thing about brand and marketing, right? You can talk about the evils of it all the time, but it's one of the best ways to communicate and educate if you do it well. Mm -hmm. So is it, is it about educating people in coffee, baristas, producers, people in the supply chain, or is it actually about creating the, the perceived value at a marketing level for the customers that's really going to drive the change? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think that it's both. I think that in the coffee industry, because we're also immersed in it, we think that everybody else knows the same knowledge that we do, and they and they don't. Um, oftentimes, <laughs> baristas, 
I mean, it's there's a lot going on, but I think like baristas and even wholesalers, for example, don't. Well, I agree. I think. Um, I mean, there's just so coffee's like you. I think coffee's unique as to work in it professionally, uh, in regards to the amount of areas and subjects you almost need to know about. Um, you know, and you could be into coffee, and then you have to learn about some engineer and um, engineering, but you're not an engineering expert, or you could be engineering driven but you have to learn about this food product and mm -hmm. so there's a lot of people with a lot of broad knowledge but um sometimes it isn't as deep basically right and there's i mean it's a whole culinary art as well like the roasting and everything like that that's it's its own thing but it is all all connected and i think we kind of get in our silos um within the industry and there's there's ways to open that up um, but I do think that it's important to have the the baristas or whoever is, is client or consumer facing have have that that more in depth knowledge about about coffee. Um, and for the consumer side, every time that I give talks about shade coffee, everybody's all for it. They want to know where they can buy it. My answer is I don't know because we don't we don't keep track of it. We don't have good data on it. All we have is the bird friendly certification, which we've already talked about is quite small. Um, so that's kind of where I was going with the coffee vignettes as well as I've been working with, with roasters or different or farmers as well to, to brand the coffee a little bit, to have um, that quick and easy storyline that's told about the origin with just a couple of stats about the coffee. Um, right now, the amount of shade is not on there, but I would love for that to be an attribute that we start including you know, the elevation and the varietals, and this is the percent shade cover. Um, I think that people are interested to hear these stories, but we're not telling them in a way that's that's digestible or that they're, we're not just getting the word out enough, I feel like. Yeah, I think the, um, the, the that, that tipping point, that bit where it's um, not coffee at all, but if you spend a load of money on an ad campaign and you put uh, billboards all over New York in Subway, but your product isn't in um, a corner store or an Amazon, then mm. it doesn't work because you go, well, here's the visibility and then you need the access immediately for that to work. Mm -hmm. So you, you put all that work into getting someone, you know, people's lives are busy, they're thinking about loads of things and you get them for a moment, you get them to think about shade grown. And mm -hmm. let's say it's a roaster or a shop it then needs to be quite easy for them to act on that. Otherwise it just falls away and it comes back a year or two years later, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking, is there a technology piece there where, because auditing is challenging. It, you know, I was actually talking to someone about starting, you know, what does it take to start a certification or an audit? Um, but on the flip side, could, you know, modern technology things, I don't know if you've heard of a company called Inveritas who do it like a tech company. Mm -hmm. um, who do quite a bit of mapping data points about mm -hmm. what actually is the challenges in different areas. Is it, is it transportation? Is it water? Is it uh, certain uh, access to uh, supplies, etc.? But, you know, it, could, it wouldn't be cool if there was a really simple technology like a, like a drone that mapped um, some shade cover. And actually, if I had a relationship with, a, you know, anyone, an exporter, importer, whoever, and you know, you could do that quickly to verify it, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great. I think in terms of, um, of knowing where shade coffee is, the using remote sensing is not something that is viable right now because the signatures from forest and like dense shade coffee look the same. So you have to really have people on the ground to ground truth. Um, the different points and then you can do something like that with, with remote sensing and, you know, have JS maps and stuff. Um, what, what's it, what's a JS map? Uh, just the geographic information systems. It's a software program where um, you can display maps and you can do some statistical analysis and. Sounds cool. Yeah, it's fun. I like that. <laughs> um, so that's, that would be something that's, that's great. Um, in terms of, of like immediate purchase, that's something that I've incorporated within the coffee vignettes is I have like a purchase button on there that goes directly to the, the roasters website. So if somebody has the coffee and they like it, they're able to get it immediately because I, I agree, like people, especially nowadays, they don't wanna wait for anything. I mean, even, you know, a couple of days to get a package. So, 
something that has immediate gratification. I think. Yeah, I think what, what, what I like about it as a, you know, if we go back to the other video about all of these terms that are very hard to define, you know, what is ethical copy, what is sustainable. Top. So I think what's interesting about this topic is it may be hard to certify it, source it now, get people, but it, it potentially is more concrete. So if you were a coffee roaster look saying, look, I want, you know, these, these are our values and I want to source coffee and have a positive impact. I think it's interesting because it's potentially one that could, you know, be less open to interpretation if, if it was done properly. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think, I mean, going back to like auditing or certifications, I think that that right now, I, I, the system is a bit broken. So also at the Rico talk, one of the producers said um, something like, like copy sort of, or yeah, copy certifications just cost the producers money. So they're not seeing much of a premium based on the certifications. Yeah, for the it, it effectively uh, becomes an access point, right? So, you know, I always try to, I think, it's a, you know, a, a thought process that I try and encourage everyone, whether they work in the UK or uh, America or any non-coffee producing country, uh, is to think, is to take, take the idea of it being coffee growing off the table and just think about it as a business, like your own independent business. Mm. And, um, you know, for us, for example, if we want to get a product into grocery in the UK, um, we <clears throat> have to go, we have to spend a lot of money um, to be certified from a, a food safety point of view. Now we can also sell that coffee to cafes and restaurants without that certification. Um, and in fact, ironically, because you access a larger client, you end up probably making less margin. So you double doubled, you, you had to pay to have the right to access that potential commerce. And the potential commerce you're accessing is probably going to be, you know, more um, sort of commercially ruthless, right? So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that it just creates, it, it potentially accesses you to more volume, but it doesn't necessarily mean, mean a premium or um, an improvement to your business, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. If, if I was a coffee farm and I only produced X amount of coffee, because that's the thing, right? It's the same, like a, a cafe a cafe owner is probably, you know, in, they could open multiple cafes. It's probably a better, a better example to a farm. You know, you've got a fixed space. You, you can only grow so much on here. So the more successful you are, well, you can't just keep scaling. You know, like a coffee roaster, you can buy a new roaster, move to a new site, scale, 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 scale. And mm -hmm. so some of those benefits of like working with large partners and certifications, they open up doors to scale. But if you can't scale and you've got a fixed finite space, it's a completely different mindset. You're like, how can we maximize the value of this fixed space? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I just, I'm thinking if I had a coffee farm that was X amount of hectares, I would not want to be doing the certification. You would want to be doing the highest quality and find a buyer that would pay you the highest price. Yeah, and I'd want to skip all the certs, yeah. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah, but I guess, again, that's all contextual, whether you, you know, where your farm is and what coffee you can grow, et cetera. Right. Yeah, interesting. The, um, in, in my conversations following that video, it seems that um, generally the most, people feel that the Starbucks uh, sourcing program is actually probably the best. I've heard, I've heard that from, from farmers. So the cafe certification or it's yeah, not really cafe good, practices, yeah. but their standards, right? Their practices. Um, I've heard from farmers that that is, gives them the, the most uh, price premium for their coffee, but it also is, um, it's different from a certification because just because you meet those standards and you jump through all the hoops to abide by the cafe practices doesn't mean that Starbucks is going to buy your coffee. Right, so, because you, you've basically gone through a certification process for one client and it's not useful for any other client. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're a big client. <laughs> but, <yeah. laughs> no, I think it's interesting because one of the things, what I tried to sort of play devil's advocate with specialty, you know, specialty community following that conversation you know, somebody made a really strong argument to me. They said, okay, well, the value of specialty was, you know, was a premium, increasing the 
the, the perceived value with uh, perceived sounds wrong, like it's a lie, but getting customers to, to learn more about the narrative and the flavor and increase the ceiling of the value that you can charge for coffee. Mm -hmm. um, but then, uh, I don't know if you saw, I did a, I did a, um, a video on, a, on the race to the bottom of specialty coffee. So if you end up, especially coffee ends up trying to compete with the mainstream and going down to those commercial prices to grow mm -hmm. into that mid market, there's a strong argument that at that point, when a cafe is buying coffee at nine, 10 pound a kilo and the, the roastery is finding the bare minimum coffee they can put in there, that actually for the supply chain, it would be better if that independent cafe was actually a Starbucks. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a strong <laughs> uh, statement, but it, you get to that point where you, you have to figure out if you're going there, right? Because, yeah. because <clears throat> those smaller companies will often say to me, oh, we can't do any auditing, we can't do this, we don't have any money. And you're sort of like, well, you end up in an interesting place where you're trying to compete with Starbucks or whoever, but not doing it as well, when really you shouldn't even be competing. You should be finding ways that, you know, you can compete in which they can't, right? Mm -hmm. And do you think that consumers, I mean, so it comes down to the, to the price as well and, and what it is that you're a consumer to pay do you think consumers are willing to pay more for 100 percent. i think i don't think consumers are the problem i think cafes are <laughs> so the, the one of the downsides of independent cafes is is um i don't offend every independent cafe right? so, <laughs> but think about it right it's hard you know all hospitality is you're busy, you're doing all the jobs, you're operating it, you're, you, if you do it really well, you manage to make, you know, not a massive profit off of a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. but you make a living from it and you, you know, and so are you really finding the time when you're running that co coffee shop to do market testing on what people would pay for coffee? No. You set your prices when you open and then maybe when you're forced to because your milk and coffee prices have gone up, you might put it up 20p or 20 cents in two years time. Mm -hmm. But I don't think independent cafe operators are pushing what they can charge with a cup of coffee. I think there's a lack of confidence there. Uh, and I think the cafe scene generally just benchmarks its price mm -hmm. prices off the more mainstream cafes. And they'll mm -hmm. put a small premium on top, but it's, I mean, you know, to turn it to turn the mirror back on myself i'm like oh yeah i don't i don't feel like i've done that with my i charge more but i don't think i've really pushed it and you know when people are coming to our cafe it's a bit out of the way they've got to walk there no one ever questions the price mm -hmm. you know and um i think again as an operator if you're in hospitality i always find uh if you have one angry customer that day that's your day mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so the problem about being on the front line is you're not you're not very statistical about it so you're thinking, oh, I've got this, these three customers who will really moan if we cut the price up, right? And there's also, I mean, I'm just giving you an example there, but I guess think a lot of cafe pricing isn't research driven. It's not strategic. Uh, it's, um, it's a bit herd mentality. Look around, what should I charge? Mm -hmm. you know? And so I 100% think customers will pay more. In fact, I was speaking to um, Noah from Cafe Imports in uh, is based in America and you know they're selling more of their expensive coffees than ever in COVID and it's the same for all the roasteries and I think COVID has proven that people will pay more and I think that cafes have not actually had their finger on the pulse of how discerning customers have become and they're a bit behind right mm -hmm. so you know, people would say to you oh look you know most people have it in milk it doesn't matter and actually you end up in this cycle of getting down to the lowest viable quality rather than trying to push the boundaries of quality mm -hmm. and so i think covid shown that a load of people when they don't have to go to the cafe they will go online and they will spend more mm -hmm. so could, this is so um it's, it's particularly i'm particularly passionate about this at the moment because i was having an argument <laughs> with, a, yeah, with a friend of mine Jamie, who will probably watch it. <laughs> Just call him out. Yeah, call him straight out. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, he was trying, he was, oh, you know, it's a good debate. And he was saying, saying that, well, if there's a shelf of wine or a shelf of beer, you have all the options there, different qualities, different prices. And mm -hmm. if that 
that market will be what that market is. And if, if he picks the best, if, if the best branding and the best beer wins him over as a customer, then they win, right? And I was like, cafes are just not like that because of geography, right? So most people, the cafe they go to is within a one mile radius of where, where they either work or live. Because if you've got a half hour lunch or an hour lunch, well, you can't travel 10 miles for a coffee, can you? Really? And so the reality is the cafe market is you're going to go to the best cafe in your vicinity. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily the best coffee you could buy. Mm -hmm. And that actually means that historically the barista has held the keys to the access of coffee for the people in that area, right? Really? But that's what excites me about the online revolution of great straight to consumer coffee is the cafe doesn't have the keys anymore. And if somebody wants to go on and buy a great, you know, because if, if someone walks into that cafe and goes, oh, what coffees have you bought? I'd love to try a, a whatever, you know, this Futura from here. And the cafe opens up, sorry, can't have that, not on the menu. Right. So I actually think um, cafes, that, I agree with what you were saying, is that the barista will be, they, they have a powerful position to be a spokesperson, uh, potentially, or a server. Um, but it's a double-edged sword for me, and and um, I think you wouldn't have this whole sort of movement of baristas and competitions and passion without that role. It's kind of interesting, but mm -hmm. the role's also holding back certain. I'm going to try and be unfair on the barista. The ca it's the cafe operators, right? Yeah, that's that's what I think. I mean, it's not you know the the barista, depending on how invested they are and and what it is that they're they're interested in learning. It's not. The onus isn't necessarily on them to gather all this information. I feel like it's more on the on the shop owner to decide that that's how they want their their shop to be run and that they want people to be educated. Um, but I think it's interesting if you're saying that you feel that consumers would pay more, um, and we're just not charging what we should. Then I feel like that that creates an opportunity too to add more value to the coffee by telling these stories and by speaking more about origin and you know the what sustainable could mean and looking at shade coffee i think that that that's a, an opportunity there for for creating awareness and people will choose the coffee and be willing to pay a higher price based on that that added value yeah 100 percent. There, there is an opportunity there for sure um and actually that's maybe one of the positive side effects of the competitive market is you know maybe operators will be forced to to think a little bit more dynamically about what their offer looks like uh moving forward and you go through this bit where it's a bit depressing because everyone's kind of doing the same thing mm -hmm. nothing means a lot and then the prices go down and actually then you get a wave of a bit more innovation and a bit more differentiation and people going actually you know let's let's start a value driven with, you know, it's that, it's that vision, right? Okay. What, what are you trying to achieve with your business? It could be anything, but mm -hmm. um, I was talking to someone who said it's a, you know, they see that the specialty coffee community is great, but in its early days when it wasn't a community, it was potentially a bit stronger because it was harder. Right. So there wasn't a community to join. Mm -hmm. You were just, you know, swimming upstream, mm -hmm. but now that it's quite, you know, the coffee scenes, there's lots that's great about it. So <laughs> there's lots of, oh, great. I'd like to be a part of that scene and, um, you know, joining, but without maybe that challenging to move the whole scene forward. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you include consumers in that coffee scene? Or do you feel like that's more roaster retailer, barista? Yeah. So I think, um, Yes, uh, I, would, I would go as far as like prosumer or hobbyist that would be in there, mm -hmm. but not mass consumer, no. Mm -hmm. So the scene is very much, um, it, it's like a quasi-professional community mm -hmm. thing. I would agree with that. But yeah. Does that make sense? It does. I, I feel like, um, I think that not that, you know, consumers have to be educated about everything, but with coffee, I, I feel like a lot of people are really into, into coffee and that they want to learn more. Like there, there's, oh, you know. I can, I can really agree. I think it's all, it's so fun. I've, I haven't been in coffee that long. It's about 15 years now, but at the beginning, 
my challenge was, you know, there's me and my wife and the baristas and the team we built, and we were trying to engage people around coffee, right? Mm -hmm. That is not that hard anymore. Like, um, <laughs> learn yeah. that bit. But it's interesting because it sort of flipped around. I think the customer would like to learn more and that the communities potentially got a bit lazy. Mm. I could see that, yeah. So it's it's sort of a strange situation. I, I, I was wondering coming out of COVID, that might be a positive that, you know, customers start to demand a bit more of, of, of the operators. Right, maybe a little more interaction. Yeah, I mean, it's tough. There's loads of interesting things, you know, without, we, we, we've sort of gone full circle to how complicated coffee is. <laughs> but um, there's other problems, right? Like the way coffee's made makes it harder to present a range of coffees. Mm -hmm. Because espresso is such a nightmare to make and you have one grinder dialed in. You know, most cafes are reducing their range of coffee because of operational barriers. Do, so... Do, so for example, if you've got one house coffee on and one filter coffee, it's, it's not very easy to educate customers about the world of coffee with two coffees. Mm -hmm. like, well, and then, you know, there's usually a line and people are busy doing other things. It's not, you know, where you're, you're standing having this, this conversation. Yeah, I think that's where, again, another interesting side of COVID is uh, customers were having to engage, sorry, uh, operators were having to engage their customers in different ways mm -hmm. and their shops are closed. <laughs> and a couple of them, you know, would, would set up an email list and they deliver coffee and stuff to people's houses. And they had like the richest conversations with their customers, more than they ever did when the shop was really busy pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. I could see that. And so those kind of newsletter lists, uh, that sort of online engagement, you know, if you can't get to your customer, but this is um, not just about education. This is actually a commercial uh, theory that quite a few people are saying, like you need to con you need to connect with your customer, not just when they're in the line. Mm. I mean, that's where the argument for like a, an app comes that remembers your order, but it doesn't have to be like that. I think, um, you know, that's where independent cafes are powerful is they build relationships with their customers. Mm -hmm. And, and that once you've got that relationship, well, you can, you know, your customer, I'm sure they'd love, your customer would love to hear what you have to say about mm -hmm. what, how you source coffee or the questions you have, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And it's fascinating to hear about your work. Uh, and Thank you. Yeah, I, I hope that um, more people start thinking about it and I'm sure we'll stay in touch and we'll see how this evolves over, you know, the next couple of years. Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much for having me.